Hello, mate to Thrive Nation. We've got Dr. Tony uh, Gallardi. I just want to get that correct. And she's a neuropsychotherapist, written three incredible books. We're going to be talking about cancer. We're going to be talking about breast cancer. And it's an honor to have her because she's a real expert in alternative treatments to cancer and to breast cancer. She's written a book called Breastquake, which I think is incredible. So I just want to really welcome someone who's dedicated her life to really empowering and transforming people's lives all over the world. So welcome to the show, Dr. Tony. It's my pleasure to be here. And I'm excited, actually, for the interview. Thanks, Steve. Brilliant. Brilliant. So maybe you can share a bit of stats. I mean, I know recently you've been on some big podcasts. We have Dave Asprey on uh, the show as well. And it was a great, great podcast episode. But every 13 minutes, a woman gets breast cancer. I know that cancer and breast cancer in men is increasing. But maybe you can sort of as a cancer specialist, because we've had oncologists on the show before, just share the current stats on cancer and breast cancer worldwide or in the US. So actually... Believe it or not, because, and I'm sure your your listeners have um, have some of this information since your show is about health. That one in two people will get cancer in their lifetimes, according to what where things are escalating now. Um, and as breast cancer goes, every two minutes now, a woman somewhere in the world is getting diagnosed with breast cancer. You know, and just repeat that because I think that's fundamentally important. You know, we've done so much corporate work now. We're working with the biggest bank in Africa and we're working with so many different corporations, but they don't really understand that statistic, you know, how important it is so that people can really prevent this chronic disease before they get it. And if they do get it, there are multiple options available to them. What's also disturbing, statistically speaking, I have a lot of, you know, I back up everything that I uh, share in this book with with statistics and research. But one of the things that's most disturbing is younger and younger women. Uh, for a very long time, about 12% of breast cancer diagnoses were women in their 30s or 40s and, and even sometimes younger. But that literally in two years time has doubled uh, somewhere between 24 and 25% now of diagnoses are in younger women and they're more advanced. They're actually more advanced cancers. So let's let's just repeat that statistic. So one in two people will get cancer. Uh, we had Dr. Zach Bush on the show and he said one in two men and then one in three women. So I know there's those stats out there and it's, it's really like crazy that exponential increase. But what about women? I mean, how many uh, people in will get breast cancer? Is it one in eight or is it one in seven? I know every two minutes. I mean, that's crazy. So the, so the statistic is uh, currently, and, I, and again, it depends on how developed a country is, right? So, but in the United States, one in eight right now, is somewhere between one in seven and one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. I feel that from what I see progressing, especially in younger women, that that those numbers are are actually not quite the whole picture. You know, I think that they're actually you know accelerating. So that's crazy. Now I do want to talk about the mind body connection because you've got a brilliant book, and I think that's very important. I want to talk about toxins and and detox. Yeah. I think those two areas are significant from the xenoestrogens and the phytoestrogens, and that. Absolutely. But, your relationship with your your breasts, and actually before I do that, maybe like men, I know it's increased. I had uh, a cousin of a cousin, a family member that we had, grew up with her, and her husband got breast cancer, which was a big shock to us. But give us the stats on sort of male breast cancer. So that's also increasing for a very long time. It was only a half of one percent of all diagnoses were men. And um, actually, the publisher, Amazon, was the original publisher of this book. And um, their marketing rep was so interested in this, he actually did some in investigation. And what he reported back to me is that it's actually doubled in, and is now getting closer to 2% of men. I think because, and I don't know what's true worldwide, but obesity in the United States has gone skyrocketed. You know, and so when the mammary glands of the pectoral muscles start to accumulate fat, that creates an estrogen dominant situation, right? Yeah. And estrogen dominance in men, as in women, um, is a breeding ground for cancer. So, 
That's crazy. So let's talk about the relationship with one's breast. I've got a seven-year-old daughter, I've got a 90 year old son, and just obviously the role of breast, why they're so important. And any body part, I mean, the mind connection is just so important. And, you know, there's such mm -hmm. a psychological, you know, rich uh, data set on how important the mind-body connection is and how we see our body. Let's talk about breasts and our relationship to our breasts. Yeah, so the first chapter of the book is is dedicated to that, which I did. I decided I would I, because I just wanted to get to the root of why I got breast cancer. I'm a normal weight woman. I am a gluten free, organic girl who exercises. You know all the things. My mother didn't. There was no history on my mother's side of breast cancer. You know, so I wanted to look at what might be the root causes of breast cancer. And so I decided to interview women. Um, and so I interviewed a hundred women on how they feel about their breasts. Because when I looked back, because I'm a psychotherapist. So when I looked back and I believe that there are often, as you said, mind body connection. When I, when I started developing breasts and they came very fast, very quickly, um, all of this attention that started to come from boys and it doesn't, it feels overwhelming for a pre-adolescent girl you know, to uh, get all that attention and, you know, and to to not feel safe walking down a street without construction workers, you know, kind of barraging you with comments and boys talking to you at the, you know, breast level instead of eye level and all of that that goes with having breasts. So I interviewed women and what was fascinating to me was, uh, and I talk about this in this first chapter, was how many women, if you had really large breasts, had discomfort about it. If they had really small breasts, they had they felt like they were inadequate. You know, the only women that I seemed to, that seemed to have a pretty normal relationship with their breasts were gay women. You know, um, especially if they were athletes, because it didn't get in the way. You know, if they had small breasts, that was great. You know, so there is this male influence that we have. You know, in terms of what role it plays in body shame, how we feel about our bodies and how we feel about our breasts. So it was an interesting inquiry and asking about our mothers, you know, like what did your, how, what was your impression of how your mother felt about her breasts and about your breasts, you know? So it was interesting. And is there research to show that if people have don't have good, you know, breast awareness or breast relationship that they predispose to having more, you know, breast cancers or breast issues or body image issues in that area? You know, I mean, the relationship with your breast, do you name them? I know a lot of men name their penises. They've got a relationship with their penises. I mean, is there something that as a neuropsychotherapist that you can sort of, as, as you go, just think of like my seven-year-old daughter and all these sort of keynotes I'm doing at schools that people can actually now action from a psychological mind-body connection? I think it has to do with uh, the whole, you know, area of body shame, you mm. know, with and. As, as big a deal as it was when I was a teenager about being slender and um, a certain body type in the United States anyway, um, it's gotten like with social media, the, the body shame and body hatred has gone up exponentially in young girls. And they're comparing themselves to, to who's doing Instagram and who's doing TikTok and all of that, I think, has created more body shame. And as a result of the body shame, I believe because, what do they say? The issues are in the tissues. And if we are 70% water, how we talk to our body, you know, our bodies, how we talk to them will very much influence how, um, I, I believe, how healthy they are. So. so it's basically is shame related to disease? Is there a lot of research saying if someone's got shame around their breasts or their backs or just their body, then that can really uh, result in disease or even cancer? Where the where the hard research is, is with um, addiction. We know that addiction and we know that trauma, these two things, and of course, trauma pre precedes addiction, right? So trauma in childhood uh often there's a huge correlation between trauma in childhood and cancer 
and in, and with breast cancer, we we you know there has been a lot of research to show that. There's a whole chapter um, that I addressed relationships, romantic relationships, and again, getting studies. You know how expensive it is, right? To, if you don't have a study that's being um, supported by a pharmaceutical firm because they're expensive to do, they're not easy, you know. But there was a study done in China on uh, with women who were getting breast cancer in their 30s and 40s, and they looked at what was the common denominators environmentally, and the only thing that they could see that was in common because these were women who came from different socioeconomic classes, different diets, whatever was a toxic marriage. That was the one thing that was, was the common denominator. So if you think about it, typically if someone enters into a toxic marriage, they've often come from some kind of trauma in childhood. I mean, that's my experience as a psychotherapist. Yeah. You know, very few people get into healthy adult relationships who haven't, unless they did a lot of work first, unless they um, weren't traumatized in childhood. Okay, so possibly if they don't have sexual trauma, then just having body shame for many, many years can just sort of predispose them to getting breast cancer. And so that obviously that shame and accepting your body and maybe having a relationship with your body. I mean, how important is it to, like, how do you define if someone's got body shame? Is it self-talk? Are there any assessments? I mean, you know, we talk about shame and guilt and revenge and unforgiveness causing cancers and that, you know, my practice of 25 years as a functional medicine doctor, but mm. how do you assess this? I mean, obviously there's neuropsychotherapists like yourself or psychologists and that, but it seems like there's no objective ways to find out if people do have body shame. Mm -hmm. No, it's often self-report. Mm -hmm. It's just self, -report. you know, how, how do you measure yeah. this? Right. Yeah, How do you measure the question, you know, and is there, are the assessments online and do you offer a way that people can actually assess to say, hang on, actually, I might not be have been sexually abused, but I'm on some type of spectrum of body shame. Because once you're aware, then possibly then you can act, even though if it's not sort of pathological. Because it's not just, you know, sexual trauma in childhood. You know, there's all kinds of trauma in the family and ways in which you're treated. I, you know, Everything, you know, I manifested, uh, you know, lots of different things at a young age because I was growing up in a family where there was active addiction. My father was a gambler and um, and all of my siblings, all brothers were normal weight. And I was coping as the eldest child uh, with this by eating. And so I put on a lot of weight, which probably started to create the menses at, at an early age, I was 11. And so all that weight itself began to develop in, in me that body shame issue. And I see it in young women all the time, you know, that those who don't have a really healthy relationship, don't, don't learn to love their bodies as they are. Now, more of this is happening. There are more, um, especially in the black culture, right? They they don't have the same, uh, at least in the United States, uh, the same kind of pressures that I think Caucasian women have, young women I'm talking about, in terms of their bodies. I think there's much more um, uh, body, expressing power around the body. There's a particular term for it and I can't remember what it is at the moment, you know, um, body being body positive, you know, uh, that's happening more and more. And I would like to see it happen more and more. There's not an assessment, Dr. Tony. Maybe you can give sort of just three tips right now for someone who's got kids, teenagers, or even if someone's mm -hmm. struggling with body shame, what should they be saying? What should be the self-talk? How should, you know, what, what can we do to really help people? And, and this is men and women and body shame. I, I think what happens is you might not be sexually traumatized, but if you have body shame for long enough, it's going to manifest in something, you know? Right. So what so Give yeah. you, I'm going to give you an example of something I saw on Instagram yesterday. And it was the, these little girls, I don't know, maybe four or five were being asked, who in your life do you think is beautiful? And over and over again, they said, my mommy, right? And, and, didn't, and you know, what was interesting is when you cut to in this one case of the mother, she was pretty, you know, she was probably 30 pounds overweight. And this little girl didn't have any of that stuff yet going on, right? She says, my mother is beautiful. And the mother said the same thing back. She said, and you are beautiful just the way you are. Mm 
So getting those kind of messages into children at a very young age, that their bodies are beautiful and, um, and teaching them to, to be respectful of their bodies. You know, um, there's all kinds of practices, mm -hmm. such as when you put lo lotion on your on your body, you know, teaching a child at a young age, when you put lotion on your body, saying nice things to you, like how good this feels and how good I feel in my body. This is key. Yeah, that's powerful. And then they develop that <laughs> and the way they see themselves. And that's crucially important. Uh, let's talk about two avatars. I'm sure you've you've gone through thousands of clients over the years. I know that you've got your own story with regards to healing yourself of breast cancer. And I think you can share that but many people look at these heroes like yourself that have written books and said, oh, well, Dr. Tony did it, but that's, you know, she's super woman and I'll never be able to do that. And they look at these stars and they just say, I just want to hear two stories from an average person, you know, maybe an executive or someone just like, you know, that, that I can relate to that looked at the mind body connection, like an avatar that is living in a modern day city and with modern day streets. I mean, this is know, why I, I wanted something that was do it yourself. Because when I looked at how expensive it is to go to, at least in this country, to go to a functional medicine doctor, um, <clears throat> at least in the United States, a lot of women who will just go the route of what the insurance company will pay for. And what the AMA came out with last year in their, their journal, um, they came out with a, a statistic that there was concern about what the cost long-term that they're seeing in women with breast cancer uh, in terms of treatment. Yeah. So I wanted to find a way to kind of sell women on the idea that you could actually, there's something, for example, called SEAC T. I get nothing from these people, okay? I just believe in their product. So, because it has a hundred years of clinical research behind it. Um, and this particular company that I, this couple in Boston, and they send it to all over the world, you know, it comes in a powder, you mix it with water, you let it sit for 12 hours, and um, put it in the refrigerator and you drink it three ounces on an empty stomach three times a day. That product alone has, I mean, they have testimonials on their website of how people reversed cancer. There was a woman just recently reversed breast cancer using just their tea, but I did other things as well, you know, because I wanted to really um, make sure that, that I also wanted to, to do this quickly. You know, I was able to reverse a stage two breast tumor in, in six months. And um, so I did a number of different things, but that alone, and that's not expensive, you know, to do. It'll cost you $25 a month or something like that. So, yeah. But let's talk about a story. When I say an avatar, give us a story of one of your clients or someone, you don't mention names, of someone uh -huh. with mind-body connection. And if you've got a male story as well, then I'd really appreciate it. But look from a mind-body perspective, because there's not much information out there, you know, I've been doing Chinese medicine for a long time and looking at herbal products. And I think it's brilliant and functional medicine, but we, we don't get too many guests talking about, okay, this is the person that came in and I used like psychotherapy or mind body techniques and the cancer was cured or went away. Uh, so give us some stories there, which I think can encourage people out there. So I know someone who had um, lobular, which is, you know, a, a very serious kind of breast cancer. And she had stage two invasive a lobular uh, and her breast surgeon told her because she decided to, um, we were working together and uh, she decided to forego traditional treatment. He told her she was going to die if, uh, if she didn't, if it was going to progress, you know. And she just for, forewent that. And I actually mentioned her in my book. Um, a lot of the people who come to me, I send women who are seeking breast cancer, of the functional medicine kind of approach to breast cancer to the, the breast cancer surgeon who is now a functional medicine doctor who um, wrote the foreword to my book. And she has many cases that she has helped women because she left the profession because she saw the racket that was going on in terms of um, how medicine, you know, because 
there's two, there's two things here. There's the surgery to take them off. And then there's the surgery to augment, you know, to put new breasts in. And she, she really began to see faults in the system and moved into functional medicine. So I'm, I send a lot of people for the functional medicine piece to Dr. Jen, Jennifer Simmons. If someone wants to work with, and this is where I come in, because this is a huge piece. Um, if they're in career burnout, if they're, if they're not doing something that really is aligned with their purpose, then they work with me. And I have helped many people and there's been a lot of healing that has taken place. I do have a client, you know, who worked with me, who um, was in complete burnout. You know, she was an executive uh, in corporate America and, um, and she did the functional medicine piece with Dr. Simmons and with me, uh, we worked on uh, getting her out of this career and into something she really loves to do now as an artist. So, you know, there is a process and I, that's why I talk about, there's a whole chapter I devote to specific careers that make you more vulnerable to breast cancer. We have data on this, you know, and um, where, the, where it's the lowest, and where it's the highest. Mm -hmm. And so just being in, in certain careers can make you more vulnerable to breast cancer. So I work, that's my work. I'm a career coach. And um, I, you know, I work deeply with people in terms of what's locked in the body because there's a fear of change. There's a you know, fear of, of losing your income and all kinds of things that are a part of this process. So that's my, I, I know what my lane is. You know, um, Yes, I healed myself without the help of a doctor. Um, just going and doing research. And that's what I put in this book, the DIY, the do it yourself you can do. However, some people do need to be managed by a physician and that's where Dr. Simmons comes in. Sure. And, so, and, I got that, and, and I'm not sort of, sort of undermining that at all, negating the fact of going to a functional medicine doctor. We've been doing functional mm -hmm. medicine for a long time. I just think people also need to hear your piece, you know, as a career coach, finding your purpose. I'd love to hear more about the careers that sort of increase your chance of getting breast cancer. But there must be a lot of things that people can do from a psychological perspective, obviously yourself, maybe you want to mention your story, but what they can do from a psychological framework, which is crucially important. I mean, unforgiveness causing, I think there must be research on that, unforgiveness and resentment with regards to cancer. So maybe start us with your framework with regards to your own story and then other people's story where it's changed your lives from a cancer perspective. So I did do a deep excavation with myself in terms of looking at um, my relation. My parents had one of the things that was a part of the trauma, trauma, trauma. You know, it can be recent trauma. Within a five-year period, I lost a lot of people in my life. And I made a major move across country and uh, broke up an, an engagement. And we have data. We know what happens to the immune system when someone makes radical changes or has many losses in a short period of time. So that was a, a fundamental piece that if you don't process that stuff at the time, which means, you know, going in the way that I work with it is going into the body and, and I work with my client and finding that, you know, cause that's the somatic piece, finding where it's lodged, you know, if there's old stuff with a parent. And so I did some work around forgiveness with my father, for example, and a lot of work around that and clearing where I was lodging my own unforgiveness toward him. Um, and this is how I work with my clients as well, is to find where it's locked because the issues are in the tissues. Yeah. So it's probably fundamentally important from a chronic disease perspective. And I mean, often the manifestations from the functional medicine tests are coming from the emotional trauma and you know, I love, uh, I think, uh, was it Gabor Mate who said, trauma is not what happens to you, but what happens inside of you. So if there's these tra traumas and these wounds, people are going to need to look at them and work on them. So would you even advocate people just living in a modern day city to, to, to go and see someone? Maybe it's a career coach. Maybe it's an, a psychotherapist. You know, maybe it's looking at these things that you might not be an, an, like sort of totally unaware of that are causing disease in your life or have the potential to cause disease. Yeah, we're again, we're living in an environmentally uh, toxic you know, world 
and our food, you know, in the United States, they allow glyphosates and GMOs and things like that in the food. In Italy, for example, they eliminate, they you know, will not, you know, as of, I think, 2022, there's, they outlawed it, you know, so, but in this country, it's still allowed. And so there is that whole environmental piece. And I talk about that in this book, the environmental toxins. But on top of that, it's how you're processing emotion. Yeah. So the kind of person who can, uh, for example, clear things out of their system and keeping your liver clean is really key. You know, I um, that's where, again, this SEACT on a maintenance dosage, I continue to take, you yeah. know, to keep liver clean in a dirty world. Yeah. Um, but also the work on, on a daily basis of clearing the emotions. I have an ex exercise. I created a, you know, a CD with certain exercises on it. And one of them is um, scanning the day, like going back and seeing where did I take in anger or grief or frustration or whatever by going through from the moment you walk, you got up to the moment you went to bed and, and clearing it, like getting in touch with it. Like, this is what I'm feeling. Okay. And what I do is I, I'm, you know, I have a transpersonal approach. So I believe that there is this quantum field mm -hmm. and we can access that quantum field for radiant light, which is just unconditional love basically. And bringing that energy of the quantum field through the body, through the, through the top of the head. Einstein, you know, said, you know, he was a mystic. You know, he understood that there was this, this source energy that we could access for healing. So bringing that radiant light through the top of your head right into that place where that stuck stuff is so that you're doing an energy cleanse, just like you take a shower at night, you know, before you go to bed. You need to clean out, you know, the world, you know, your etheric body. We have all these uh, etheric bodies that are, surround our physical body. They need to be cleansed as well not just our physical body. So I teach people to do that, you know, uh, at the end of every day. Brilliant. Maybe we can get a link to that CD. I think that's important. I think a lot of people aren't doing sort of emotional work. You know, they're not, that the emotional health is a problem. The emotional regulation, the, the EQ, the emotional intelligence is a problem. So they can't, they're not self-aware. They can't self-regulate. They don't have social awareness or relationship awareness. And, you know, I've seen in my practice since COVID now, and people just come and emotionally vomit, you know? And so I've got to just send that back and not take that on and not hold on to yes. that. And I've yes. needed therapy in my life in the last year than I've ever needed. In fact, I wasn't at a therapy. <laughs> but, uh, you, you can you only know, imagine. My, yeah, my wife said to me, she said, look, you, you need to go and see someone. You, you are holding on to... You know, patients became friends and then friends got cancer and friends got autoimmune disease. And and these things after 25 years, you, you can hold on to them. And, and I think there's a huge gap uh, with sort of a lot of the listeners are corporates, executives and, you know, people that are highly ambitious and, and working up, you know, either in their own business. They're not doing the emotional work. And I think that detrimentally is causing a lot of disease and sickness. Um, I totally agree. I have a client who works for Microsoft in the United States. And he is just, he's in such burnout The the, his bosses, I'm not going to say which country they come from, but, uh, are brutal, you know, and, and they're just churning people through and he's in an advanced, uh, leadership position, but is feels on completely unseen by, and he's starting to get sick, you know, yeah. so he came to see me. Yeah, that's powerful. So let's go into toxicity, which I think is a huge thing. You know, I've been doing labs for so long, and I see teenagers with gynecomastia and these man boobs, and I'm just seeing testosterone plummet. And the research shows that 45% of free testosterone decreased over the last 20 years. I had a brilliant doctor on my show, Dr. Tracy Gappin, who runs the Gappin Institute, incredible neurologist doing functional medicine. And he's just, we have a, you know, have a hormonal crisis. Uh, testosterone is just in male and female and, and, and women don't realize they actually have more testosterone in their bodies you know per volume than, than estrogen and this estrogen dominance and xenoestrogens and phytoestrogens so tell us your overall view of toxicity and hormones how you look at it within your frame on, in, in breastquake yeah well you know i talk about xenoestrogens and those are the the we've collapsed women think all estrogen because of that the uh, study that was very faulty done in the early 90s um, by the World Health Institute 
and um, about estrogen. And the truth of the matter is it's not estradiol that causes breast cancer. It's xenoestrogens, which are, you know, manufactured from what we take in from toxins in the environment and obesity, you know, that the xenoestrogens love belly fat, for example, you know? And so, yeah, t as testosterone is going down because estrogen, you know, the estrogen levels are going up. And so that estrogen dominance, and they're seeing in men in their thirties with low testosterone, this is not good. <laughs> yeah. And so do you know, uh, obviously from a functional me medicine point of view, you send it to the doctor, but practically what people can do, like the biggest things that can help them. I know that Dr. Gap and one of the big things he said, you'll never ever drink anything that's in a plastic, you know, whether it's a Gatorade, not that he drinks a lot of that, whether it's a water bottle, he won't drink anything in plastic. What are the, say, the top three or four sort of areas that you help people limit the xenoestrogens? Yeah. Um, well, there's obviously plastics, you know, are all about that. But there's also things that, again, you can take that, that help to clear the liver, you know, uh, milk thistle, for example, helps with liver, Dandel drinking dandelion tea helps, NAC, N-acetylcysteine helps with just, we need to be, we're just in living in a world now, we have to be doing liver cleansing all the time on some maintenance level. And that helps, you know, keeping, keeping hormone levels balanced. Exercise, it's a big thing. You know, I was looking at a picture my partner and I were looking at, um, there was a, a picture of real estate, 50 real estate agents and contractors uh, in uh, Sardinia. Actually, they were in Milan, but they, the project was in Sardinia, Italy. And we looked at this picture and he said to me, what strikes you about this picture? I said, there's not one overweight person. <laughs> <laughs> and whereas in the United States, we, we it's a big problem, you know, but in Italy, people walk and ride their bike and they move. So exercise, huge sweating that cleans out xenoestrogens from the body. You know, um, stress is a huge thing that converts into xenoestrogens in the body, you know? So looking at your, like how meditation, bringing meditation in, Qigong is powerful, you know, um, yoga nidra is powerful, creating a stress management program for yourself, looking at, a, again, what I mentioned earlier, which is what kind of work are you doing? Are you doing work that you love? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just as, as Dr. Mate said, it's really about how you take in the stress. There are st good stresses, you know, if I was working on a book, you know, writing this book and doing a, a private practice. But it was at that time, it was filling me because I was contributing, you know, and I was contributing both. I knew what, what the writing I was going to be able to give to the world and my clients. Yeah. So it's good stress. There's a difference. Yeah, that's good. And and what about other things? You've spoken about supplements, multisol, NAC, that's really good. Sweating is very, very good to get rid of them. Do you look at uh, infrared sauna or sort of a detox, detox program? Uh, I think that's very important. I say, you know, I'm in the infrared sauna six days a week. It's one of the most important times. I believe the things like chlorella, zeolite, spirulina, activated charcoal, bentonite clay, uh, very, oh. very important. But, but, but tell me your specific sort of detox program. Obviously, avoid, we haven't spoken about all the, you know, the aesthetic products and and all the phthalates and, and and the things that are in these and the sls and that but tell us your personal detox protocol that you've seen being very beneficial so i take nac every day you know um i drink dandelion tea and i drink essiac tea um i do i also take chlorella um capsules um every day um cilantro tincture mm -hmm. Because I do eat, I'm pretty much like I would do a call a pescatarian. Um, I don't eat dairy. Um, I'm pretty plant based, except I do have fish, you know, once or twice a day. So, you know, even though it's wild, I, you know, do key, try to chelate the mercury by doing things like chlorella and cilantro. Okay. So, tell us about the cancer free diet. What are your views of preventing cancer? If you've got cancer, what should be, people be eating? 
I would say if you can and do what you can, but if you have a diagnosis, I highly recommend a plant-based diet, you know, um, because uh, animal products are acidic. And what you're wanting to do is alkalinize the body as much as possible. Drinking a lot of water um, that has minerals in it. I know that I have, I haven't personally taken hydrogen water, you know, but I understand that's really wonderful. Uh, things that are going to flush the toxins out of the body is really, really important. Drinking enough water. Um, minerals, taking minerals. You can get actually online, maybe you have that, I don't know, in your, your program of uh, test, testing minerals to see where people's minerals are, uh, testing for metals, you know, things of that nature. Um, so much of this can now be done online. And these are things you can take on a daily basis that you have to, you have to just to keep, you know, things clean. Mm. Oh, that's pretty powerful. Tell us about cancer personalities. And I think this was very interesting in your book, because I think it's important. And just in summary, for people listening, we've now followed the mind body connection and shame and guilt and all these emotions that could be trapped, these traumas that could be trapped. So Go and listen to that. Then the second things are toxins, trying to avoid toxins firstly, clean air, clean water, clean food, clean skin. That's important. Then having a detox protocol in place, making sure that you detox. Sweating is the most important. And I think if you can afford an infrared sauna, that's that's powerful. But doing exercise and getting a rid of a lot of these uh, toxins. And the third things are personalities, you know, just your characteristics and maybe sort of careers that you can touch on the typical personality that is predisposed to getting cancer? Yeah, I think um, there is, again, you have to be careful with this um, because I don't want in any way place blame on anyone. But people who tend to hold things in, you know, who come from stoic cultures, you know, and ethnic backgrounds of holding things in, um, are more susceptible, you know, we do know this, you know, there's been a lot of data and, you know, um, Love Medicine and Miracles, Dr. Bernie Siegel's book is also another wonderful resource, um, but holding things in so that they become, again, what is trauma? Trauma is stuck energy. It's mm -hmm. stuck energy in the body. So the degree to which someone holds something in and then doesn't let it go, and that's the key, you know, you'll see, you know, on the streets, I know I'm referencing Italy again, but you'll see on the streets, the Italians will get out of their cars, yell and scream at each other, and then hug each other. You know, I mean, it's like it's over, you know, they don't hold on to it. They don't, you know, nurse, nur nurse resentments. I mean, that is what I'm saying is that, you know, it's, it's okay to let something out, but then it's important to come back into to homeostasis, which is to bring your energy into balance again and clear any anger that you were, you were experiencing so that it doesn't turn into inflammation because that's what it does. Anger becomes inflammation in the system and inflammation will then cause cells to mutate, which mm. becomes a tumor. Okay. Careers or sort of situations that could have increased your chance of getting cancer? Tell us. So at the you know, my gynecologist, I had given her my book. She said, I'm afraid to read this chapter. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, physicians are the, you know, there is the love, the likelihood is greatest with breast cancer, you know, with women who are in these professions. And of those professions, for whatever reason, orthopedic surgeons were even higher, you know. I have my theory about that which is, and I could be completely wrong. This is just a theory. And my theory about orthopedic surgeons is that it requires a lot of testosterone to do those long surgeries, you mm. know, um, and, and a physical labor, you know. Um, and so the kind of women, often the kind of people who become orthopedic surgeons were athletes, you mm. know. Um, and sometimes women who have more testosterone and don't have enough estrogen, and I'm talking estradiol, not the stuff that accumulates in your belly in terms of belly fat, but estradiol. If there isn't enough estradiol, um, what can happen is then cancer. So this is, we're doing a, there's a game changer now about estrogen. Women need more estrogen, not less. Yeah, well, tell us more on that because I think that's very important, you know, because hormones are crucial, but 
tell us what the sort of preconceived idea is and, and what they actually need. So it's believed that somehow as a woman ages and she loses estrogen, that, some, that it's bad to take bioidentical hormones. And what Dr. Gersh, I, you know, there's several, about six or seven functional medicine doctors who gave me endorsements for this book. And Dr. Felice Gersh, for example, who's a gynecologist, integrative gynecologist in California, said if this was, if it was about estrogen, it would be young women predominantly getting cancer, not postmenopausal women, not women who are losing estrogen getting cancer, breast cancer. So what it's about is uh, looking at other factors. What, what is causing toxicity in the body? What is, you know, the liver, how the liver is not clearing, you know, and that is the key, you know, to, so she, she and Dr. Lindsay Berkson and Dr. Simmons all, and Dr. Desalienne, who interviewed me on her show, Dr. Veronique, who wrote a, an amazing book on um, healing breast cancer naturally, had breast cancer herself twice. And she, all of these doctors are saying women post breast cancer need estrogen and progesterone in the right combinations mm -hmm. in order to thrive. Yeah, that's profound. And I think if you're listening to this, understand you need to take the bioidentical form as well. Go and see right. a medicine doctor who understands that. And if you're a woman, right. it's not only estrogen and progesterone, but testosterone as well. That needs to be monitored in, in, in this crazy world. And but it has to be monitored. I I my doctor just immediately put me on mm -hmm. testosterone as well as a bioidentical testosterone cream along with the estrogen and progesterone. And I have the estrogen in a patch and the progesterone in a capsule. And I I take DHA, I take 10 milligrams of DHA every day, which helps support adrenal function. And if it's if the pathways are clean and clear will convert into testosterone. And we rechecked three months after um, I started on this cream, my testosterone levels, and it was a very low dose of uh, cream, were way high. So not everybody needs testosterone, you yeah. know? So that's why it's so important to be managed, to be rechecked after you're given it. I think after the show ends, we can get some of those, uh, hopefully those physicians and have them on look at this sort of process because I think it's crucially important you know to give people alternative options through functional medicine but let's let's talk about what sort of biohacking you know biohacking I love the word uh, just because we have to hack against big food and we have to hack against big telecommunications and we have to hack against you know sort of big financial institutions that are often enslaving us and and causing a lot of distress just because of the models they have there what about uh, sort of cell phone radiation? I mean, there's been a lot out there with wire bras and, you know, Dr. Andrew Huberman looking at, you know, carrying your cell phone in your front pocket and that reduces testosterone, sperm motility, sperm structure. What have you found from an environmental, from a radiation perspective and a biohacking perspective has helped your clients and your patients? So I recommend just as one little, you know, because it's about... If you introduce too much, because I am a change management expert, and if you introduce too much change, it's too overwhelming for people, you know? So as it, as it applies to cell phones, what I recommend, what I do at night is shut all, um, you know, devices off, you know? After I've watched television, I pull it out of the, uh, out of the uh, plug so that everything is off. The, you know, the internet is off. My cell phone is off. That, uh, uh, just getting enough sleep. And we haven't really talked about sleep and that is really key. I think that sleep deprivation is a, also a part of why cancer in general has skyrocketed is we're, we're too, um, you know, radiated by, you know, uh, by these, you know, devices till late at night, people are on their phones and on their computers till midnight. And if the more sleep you can get between 9 PM and midnight, is worth the whole 12 to six, you know, that's what the sleep research shows. Yeah. So the more sleep you can get before midnight is fundamental, fundamental and shutting everything down. And as well, cell phone, you know, like I only use my speaker. I try to only use my speaker on, on my cell phone. Um, I don't put, use, I have them. I have the, the Apple headset, you know, that goes in your ear. I don't use them anymore. 
You know, yeah. I just keep the phone as far away from my my body as possible. Yeah. And what about wide bras? I mean, have, have things changed to such a large degree that the metal around breasts is causing significant problems, do you think? Is that something that people should consider? You know, um, I think there's, the data is conflictual on that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it has to do with how, you know, how much um, of the lymphatic fluid is being you know, moved around. So if you're exercising and your your breast, there's also, oh, you know, there's a technique that, that was actually taught to me and I put it also in the book called breast flapping, which is every night, you know, taking your hands. So if you do need to wear, there are lots of bras that don't require wires. You know, I don't have a wire bra anymore. So, uh, and I, as much as possible, I don't even wear a bra anymore, you know? So, but for those who work in corporate environments and they have to, you know, dress in a particular way, at night, before bed, hanging over, literally, uh, bending over from the waist over and cupping your breasts and flapping them and moving the fluid this way and this way also gets the lymphatic fluid going. You know, exercise does that as well. You know, anything that's going to make the breasts move is important. Good. And then I think you spoke about breast massage and releasing oxytocin. I think there was a research on it article on that how important is breast massage if your partner can do it or you can do it within yes. what, what type of oil would you recommend so i combine um frankincense oil with a carrier oil uh, which you can even use olive oil but um but adding frankincense uh, oil to um to a carrier oil or the rose essence is also a nice one. There was a company, you know, again, I don't get anything from these people, but I just, because I used them, I used it and they don't even know I exist. Breast Love was the name of this particular oil that I used. And it just gave me an opportunity to love up my breasts. That's the first thing I started to do when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. When I started thinking about how long I had judgments of one kind or another about my breasts, that I just started loving my breasts up. This was really key. So the, the massaging after a shower or whatever with the oil and telling yourself, I love you to your breasts. You know, I love my breasts. My breasts are healing. My breasts are healed. You know, these are things that I think the body responds to. I really do. Yeah, that's vibrational frequencies in that. And, and possibly getting people around you. I know Lynn McTaggart's... Uh, who work mm. out of eight and maybe people around you who maybe don't put their hands on your breasts, but maybe put their hand on you or stand around you in a circle, you know, Joe Dispenza's work, you know, do you think that's quite important with regards to the- Absolutely. You, you need support. You need support. So what was so brilliant, I believe, about The Power of Eight, Lynn McTaggart's book, and her book before that, The Field, in terms of helping people to understand we are connected. We don't have to be in the same physical space with someone. And she did years of research, you know, um, with people. They started with seeds where they had a control group of seeds where uh, they just did the normal thing of watering them and rinsing them. And then they they had a group of seeds that were prayed were prayed over or sent healing energy, just radiating light, you know, that these seeds are maturing in beautiful form, for example. And so when they saw the results being so uh, amazing, uh, that's when they started working with humans. And this was before Zoom. So I asked a friend uh, if she would reach out because it was very hard for me to do. I gave them the names. I gave her the names of friends um, all over the country, you know, friends of mine in California, friends of mine here in Asheville, North Carolina, New York. And people came together they recommend at least eight people and they came together on Zoom for and it was all it was was you were you were um, asked to send healing energy to my breasts and to my whole body for 10 minutes. And oh, my God, the the stuff that came up in the first two sessions was so powerful. I mean, I weeped. I did not realize how invested I was in being the healer. Yeah. Okay, fixer, 
and um, and to let myself receive love on that level, and that people were who were these were very busy people were taking time out for sixteen weeks, once a week to do this for me. Oh my God! And then what followed was that at the session three through sixteen what would come up was ecstasy. Like I would just start laughing. I couldn't like uncontrollably joy was coming up. So I knew healing was taking place. So that is so powerful. So someone dedicated 10 minutes or eight people dedicated 10 minutes for 16 weeks. Wow. That is powerful. And you felt the changes and you experienced the changes within your body. I really did. That, that, that is another level of the quantum field and how powerful prayer and and sending these things uh so wow well done to you okay tell us anything that you you think people should know i mean we haven't discussed like underarm like i'm really concerned about like on like concerned about the aluminium and, and women using underarms or men now even more you know it's right by the lymphatic system or any creams or something that you feel that people should avoid yeah yeah, I don't um I don't use deodorants anymore, underarm deodorants anymore. The kind I just use Dr. Bronner's, the, that basic soap, because that's what when I went to the Optimum Health Institute, which is a place in San Diego for Hippocrates is the East Coast version of that in the United States, where people go to you know heal themselves of different things. I went there because I had chronic fatigue syndrome. This is many, many years ago and uh, reset my body. Uh, but they use Dr. Bronner's because it was the cleanest you know, soap there is. So I just use that. I use Dr. Bronner's and I use Cetaphil as the, my facial cleanser because I was told that's the most basic, um, inexpensive way to uh, clean your face. So I try to use things that are very, um, very healthy. Probably the only unhealthy thing I do is my Chanel mascara. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> can't give up that up yet okay maybe oral health and that mouthwash and all that you uh, use on that no, i don't use mouthwash um baking soda toothpaste is great um that that you know will definitely you know clean and yes keeping your mouth clean because if you're doing detoxification if you choose to take on and things like seac tea will detoxify the liver so if you're detoxing the body, it will show up in the mouth. And so scraping the tongue, for example, making sure that you're brushing your teeth while you're detoxing a couple of times a day, flossing, oral health, we know, I mean, the data shows is very key to the physical health. You know, there's a connection between oral health and cardiovascular health. Brilliant. Okay. Come to the end of the show. Where can people connect with you or get your book or connect with you on Instagram? Sure. Yeah. So um, if they go to drtonygalardi.com, you know, that website has a lot of information. Breastquake is the other website that's just devoted to some things that having to do with breast cancer. Um, I'm on Instagram and uh, my book is available. Breastquake is coming out in paperback format in May. Um, right now it's in hardback and in Kindle. So you can download it for somebody who's just newly diagnosed. I would recommend downloading it um, in the Kindle form because the hardback is taking a little longer. So I'm mm -hmm. actually changing publishers for the paperback. So brilliant. But I want to just declare favor and blessing over you, Dr. Tony. You're a, Thank you. just, just courageous. Uh, your career is incredible. And you've spoken out and you've given other people options and you've been a shining light yourself and you've walked the talk and you've surrounded yourself with incredible people and incredible physicians. So yeah, I just want to say thank you. And hopefully, if you're ever in South Africa, we'd love to have you here. I'm part of SASM, yeah. the South African Institute of Functional Medicine or Integrated Medical Physicians. So that's really important. And even in corporates, I mean, you know, I'm asking my guests, I think it's 199 shows now, four years. And get yes. some of my guests to come even speak to the corporates. You know, when we, we run like, you know, once a year, you come on for 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes to tell people you know, that are struggling with these conditions or have a predisposition to these conditions. I, I think it's fundamental that we've got to get out there into people's spaces and places. I agree, yeah. 100%.